He is risen. Ah, that feels good, doesn't it? Our God is so good. What a beautiful opportunity to gather together as a church family today to celebrate the fact that he truly is risen again. And what tremendous hope that brings. I pray this morning's already been an encouragement to you, and I'd be remiss not to thank right away all those hands that helped put together the wonderful spread of sweets out there today. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Absolutely. I hear it. I echo the claps, by the way. I think it's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And it uh, looks like there's probably going to be extra for afterwards, too. So by no means feel like you have to race off. Um, we'd love to enjoy the fellowship with you afterwards. Let's uh, save a donut for me or something. This sounds great. Um, I also uh, I, I need to mention a thank you for someone very quick. A number of you have been praying for Miss Becky Gwynn, and she wanted me to report that the procedure went well on Friday. She's resting up and doing much better, and she says thank you for the prayer. So I, too, want to thank you for the prayers. And what a beautiful reminder how faithful our God is and how important it is that we pray for and with each other. Um, there's plenty of things to look at in your bulletin. I'm going to let you do those things this morning as we have plenty uh, to celebrate today as well. But God is so good. God is so faithful to us. So let's uh, spend a little, the morning here in prayer to kick things off, and then we'll start our Resurrection Day service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity for us to gather together to celebrate the fact that you truly have risen again, Father. And the fact that you've risen again truly changes everything, Father. Lord, I just pray for your hand to be over every aspect of the service this morning, our time in worship as we lift up our song, our, lift up our voices in praise and in song, Father, our time in the word as we understand and come to be sanctified in the truth of your scriptures, and also in our time of fellowship, Father. I pray it would all be honoring to you, and may you be glorified, and may we be encouraged, challenged, and equipped as saints today. I ask this all in the name of the risen Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we worship together this morning?
Well, good morning. It's always fun to fight all the kids leaving as I walk up. And I don't know if you guys know, but Noah always shows up early with his dad on Sunday mornings. And he's been eating donuts like popcorn since 9.05. So uh, pretty excited for the children's church teachers today. I think his mom kept saying no more, and I kept saying, go one more. <laughs> it's, it's a fun job. Uh, happy Easter. If you guys want to join me in John 20, John 20, verses 1 through 10, for uh, an incredible account of the disciples uh, witnessing the tomb. So John 20, verse 1. Now for the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out to the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they, ran, they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linens lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw that the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the, other, the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their homes. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning again, and uh, thank you, Mr. Brian, for feeding my kids donuts. It's uh, good. It is Resurrection Sunday after all, so that's good. He had more than dad this morning, so that's, that's good. Um, boy, it's good to see you all this morning. Worship team, I want to thank you so much for helping lead us in worship this morning. What a joy to be with the saints, especially on Resurrection Sunday together. I actually want to start with a question this morning to kind of just throw out there for a moment. And make you just ponder, what's more important, Christ's crucifixion or Christ's resurrection? So the correct answer, by the way, is yes. Okay, there you go. I love my trick questions. My students couldn't stand them, but that's okay. The answer is yes, because both, both the cross and the empty tomb are absolutely vital. They're essential for our hope as Christians. In fact, it's in the cross that we see the sacrifice the Savior made to pay for our sins. And this morning, we get to look at why the empty tomb, why the risen Savior, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, is the true victory for which we still have hope today. I'm going to kick off with one more round of prayer this morning, unless we overdo it, because we can't overdo too much prayer. I really want to pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to each one of us this morning, precisely where we are, as we unpack His Word his truth for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we go to unpack this incredible passage, this uh, account of this uh, resurrection that took place just two millennia ago, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to each one of us in such a mighty way, Father. I pray he would use the truths of your word to, to really speak this truth into our own lives, Father, and we could come away with the blessed hope of the fact that our Savior lives. Our Redeemer lives, Father, and He's coming again. Ask all this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. In fact, I gave away a little bit with the prayer, because it is true. He does live. He still lives today. And the fact that He lives today means that He's interceding for every single one of us today, too. We don't serve a God who remained in the grave like any other man. We serve the God who rose again from the dead. Now, we cherish verses like John 3, 16, of how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We, we cherish verses like that. We, we love and meditate rightfully on verses like Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his own love toward us in this way, that Christ Jesus, he came while we are still sinners. He died for us. Those are powerful truths that we should never, never forget. But without the resurrection, all of those truths are meaningless. They mean nothing. 
If Jesus did not rise again on the third day, according to the scriptures, God sent him for nothing. And if Jesus didn't rise again on the third day, according with the scriptures, then God's love demonstrated for us, Jesus would still be in the grave, and it means absolutely nothing. But we kick off this morning here in John 20, of course, is really on Sunday morning, quite appropriately. It's been quite a weekend if you're the disciples, the early followers of Jesus. Because that same Jesus who you were convinced was the Messiah, the Christ, the one that would overthrow the shackles of Rome, that Friday was hanging on that cross, treated like a common criminal. And you're left wondering, I mean, you would really put yourself in the follower's shoes. What are you thinking on that weekend? Like, what have we followed? Has it all been a lie? Has it all been for nothing? I know none of us have been in quite the same situation they were, but you can probably relate to sentiments that way. You got yourself into something, a lot of people told you you were crazy, and about halfway through, you start wondering, maybe they're right. It's, it's a daunting feeling, and for these early followers, that weekend, that Good Friday all the way up until this Sunday, was a weekend of tremendous confusion, pain, and just probably for many of them, outright doubt. What was going to happen? Well, in John chapter 20, as we read this morning, and thank you again, Mr. Brian, we read about how on the first day of the week, speaking of Sunday, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. Now, I'll remind you who Mary Magdalene was, of course. Mary Magdalene was a woman, a follower of Jesus, who earlier in Jesus' ministry, he did something remarkable for her. He cast out seven demons out of her, and she never forgot She followed him ever since. And in fact, we see Mary Magdalene all over the place throughout the New Testament, kind of very closely attached to the hip of Jesus, to use a figure of speech. In fact, she was there on the cross that day. And I must admit, much like her and a couple of other women, including Jesus' own mother, does anybody remember how many of the apostles were at the foot of the cross the day Jesus died? Good, I see a lot of number ones up there, the Apostle John. In fact, the same fellow that wrote this account that we're reading right here in the Gospel of John. Mary Magdalene was one of them. We find her here on the first day of the week going to the tomb early so that she can help, along with some other women that we read about in the gospel accounts, she could help properly finish anointing with spices and do the burial customs for the body. She was going back to the tomb, convinced that the body of Jesus was still there so that they could finish the proper burial. They had to rush it before because the Sabbath was coming. so They had to keep the Sabbath. What a brutal morning. For Mary Magdalene and these ladies. It had to crush her. I mean, on the one hand, I would think going back to the body to anoint it would bring a certain amount of healing. But I imagine there's a huge part of them that did not want to go. And not just for the grief. I remind you, when you're following Jesus and Jesus himself was just crucified, what do you think they're going to do to you? This is a dangerous time to be a Christian within the community. It seemed the whole world had turned against you. And yet Mary, along with the other ladies, though John focuses just on Mary here, she travels there determined to go anyway. She's going to go see her Savior. She must see where he's laid. Now in the Gospel of Mark, and you can have fun harmonizing the Gospel accounts, you read how the women were asking themselves, how are we going to move the giant, the giant stone in front of the tomb? How are we going to get past the Roman guards and convince them to let us in? Because remember, Pilate himself under the instruction of the religious leaders, had essentially set up a whole security system around the tomb to let nobody get in. So they wondered, how are we going to do it? But there in that verse 1, as they enter the tomb early, they're they're showing up to go up to the tomb. I imagine the sun is just barely crest over the hills. You got the dew on the ground. You can see your breath in the air, so to speak. Mary sees something that changes the whole morning. The stone had been taken away from the tomb. Okay, that right there is a showstopper. That right there is nothing like you expected. Who's going to move the tomb? It's already, who's going to move the stone? It's already gone. The stone is gone. What's it mean? Well, for Mary, we see how she responded. And you find it there in verse 2. She ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, Look, at, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. Mary's first reaction upon seeing the stone rolled away is complete fear. She's overcome with grief. Somebody stole the body. It had to be so. Again, she's traveling with a a traveling party, by the way. The other gospel accounts tell us the other women are there. 
The other women apparently do not run with Mary. They stick around, and they're in for quite the surprise too. But John, following Mary, and again, he's the one writing this gospel. She came to him, for instance, to go find him. This is the first news that he hears. Now, again, I invite you to really take Mary's perspective. Can you imagine sprinting all the way back from that tomb? Your heart just pounding through your, your, your chest. And you're just thinking, you know what? They've already crucified my Savior the one that I've trusted in, the one who literally saved me from my demons. And we don't even mean it metaphorically this time. And now they stole the body? What more can they do? How low can you go? And I imagine, of course, if you're Peter and John at this point, and Peter, I remind you, the last time we've heard from Peter was denying the Lord Jesus Christ three times. I can't imagine the guilt that he's already feeling. For both Peter and John to come to this news and find out, wait a minute, he's gone? I can't imagine what they're thinking. What must they be fearing? A grave robbery? Which was, this happened occasionally within Judea, but how surprising for a grave robber to sneak into the tomb past the Roman guards and to get him? Or did the, those darn Romans take the body? What was happening? They had to investigate. And that's precisely what we find out, right? In chapter 20, verse 3 and 4, Peter therefore went out the other disciple, they're going to the tomb, and they both start to run together. And I love this historical detail. The other disciple outran Peter, came to the tomb first. I've got to admit, John's pretty quick, apparently. And John likes to brag about it, I guess. I'm fast, he said. But John says, we both took off running. They knew with the report like that, the body is gone, there's no time to waste. Now again, most of these fellas, I know John was at the foot of the cross, But again, most of the disciples, most of the apostles, they're hiding. They're just trying to figure out what way is up. Well, this was news that they couldn't stop anymore. They had to go see it with their own eyes. I'm sure there was a level of disbelief even within their hearts. And I don't want to belabor this point, but I do find it significant that the report came from a woman, Mary of Magdala. And at this time within society and Roman culture, women were considered very unreliable eyewitnesses. You couldn't trust them and take them at their word. How ironic, of course, that as you know in the gospel accounts, Jesus Christ chooses to appear to women first. I always find that amazing. But I imagine for them, they already have some doubt. There's no way. They're making this stuff up. They're just being emotional. It was dark when they left. Let's go see it for ourselves. So they get sprinting all the way down there. And as John records the fact that he gets there first, it's what we see John does next. That's very interesting. He says at verse 5, John gets there, and he stoops down, he looks in, and what's he see? These curious contents lying within, the linen cloths lying there. And yet, we read in verse 5, John did not go in. Now, first of all, why in the world does he have to stoop? Very interesting, these old tombs, especially common within that time, often had little recesses of an entrance only about three feet in height. So it'd be great for my kids. But for the rest of us, you really have to get down on your belly and kind of pull yourself in. Now, you think about a corpse, a body, a dead body, has been there for three days. I don't think it smells like a Febreze commercial. Probably pretty stinky coming in. I don't want to go anywhere near that place. And John also, he's stooping down to get a better look what's in there. And he's trying to see, but remember, it's dark. And it's not like they have electricity. So within the tomb, you can imagine a a three-foot amount of window for light to come in, it's probably a little tough to see. But John doesn't go in. Now, why doesn't he go in? Why does he stop? John doesn't specifically tell us here, but there are a couple of potential reasons. One we just gave. I mean, you got to get on your belly, get dirty, and go in. One, I think, again, you put yourself in his shoes even from our vantage point. Do you really want to go into that tomb to see things for yourself? I think it would be a little harrowing myself. We've all been to funerals and memorial services and open caskets, and there's many people who choose not to go. And you can understand that sort of pain and that grief that somebody even like John, his beloved Jesus, in fact, as he's described even in this account, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved may not want to go in. But there is another possibility, and I think this will really highlight Peter's actions next. Did you know that entering a tomb, according to the law, could actually render them unclean, ritually unclean for a whole month. John may be also thinking in terms of the law here. I don't want to defile myself. I'm going to appear from here. 
Well, that's why with humor, we can laugh at Simon Peter in verse 6. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now, I always find this humorous. John's waiting on the outside, kind of peering through, a little more careful. I won't lie, I, can, I relate to John a little bit. Jessica and I were laughing about this the other night. I'm not the risk taker. Peter dives straight in. And by dive, I think literally it's the three-foot recess. has to just dive right in there, you know, to go check things out. Peter's a man of action. It's, it's how we see him throughout the gospel accounts. He needs to see this for himself. And what he sees, again, these curious contents, is striking, absolutely striking. Now, I remind you, what John saw just looking were these linen cloths lying there. And these would have referred to the burial cloths, the burial cloths that they wrapped the body of Jesus in that Friday that the ladies were going to come back and continue to work with. Now, it would be very strange. This already helps us narrow down what happened that Sunday. Because if this was the work of grave robbers, these burial cloths were anointed with enough fancy stuff and many times the bodies adorned with like jewelry and other things that you would not leave the burial cloths. In fact, why in the world would you undress the corpse first and leave it all there? You'd haul that thing out. So already, it casts doubt on the fact that some robbers are responsible for this. But what Peter sees, and I assume John trying to peer through the little opening just couldn't see from his vantage point, Peter crawling in there, he's seeing the whole survey like a CSI agent or something. He says, well, look at this. There's even the, it says the handkerchief in verse 7 that had been around his head. It's, it's a face covering, not lying with the linen cloths, folded together in a place by itself. Now, that is strange. Why in the world would the bandages covering Jesus' face be folded up together, almost like mom used to make you fold your clothes when the laundry was done in the morning? Whoever is responsible for the body, and I'm putting myself in their shoes right now as skeptics, whoever's responsible for the body, for whatever reason, thought it was a good idea to take their time, stop what they're doing, and fold it up all nicely, origami style, and lay it there in the tomb. Does that not strike you as absurd? Well, we certainly read here in just a moment that they will find it absurd too. But this suggests to us several things. Whoever's responsible, this was not a rush job. Whoever was responsible took great care and intentionality to leave the scene precisely as it was. I think it's actually a good time right now to take stock even of where we're at with the whole case of the empty tomb. And surely, and I'm only doing this because I'm trying to walk you through even their mindset of what they must be thinking at this point upon their investigation. I remind you, the tomb itself was guarded. We alluded to it earlier. But again, the Roman guards were assigned by Pontius Pilate himself to secure and guard the tomb. In fact, there's a great irony that the religious leaders, those who sought Jesus' execution, they were more aware of Jesus' own words that he said he would rise again than evidently the disciples were. The disciples, in their grief, practically forgot it, you'd almost think. But the boy, the religious leaders who assigned the Roman guards say, go secure that tomb, lest anybody takes the body they knew. Well, the fact the guards are there with the tomb, they used to put a seal on these tombs, almost like people do with old-fashioned letters today. And you put this big old seal, think of like the seal of the President of the United States, and what that seal was, they sealed the front of the tomb. If that seal was broken, it was punishable by death. And in fact, those Roman guards, if by any chance they let anybody get into that tomb unauthorized, they too, off with their heads. Now this already, again, as they're processing these things, they live within a Roman Empire at this time in Judea. They know how these things work. Makes no sense. In fact, where are the guards? They're gone. What's happening, right? I also remind you this. The stone was rolled away. These were not pebbles covering the open tomb. It's a giant stone. Multiple men would have to be to roll this thing into place. Uh, you'd have to be Samson to lift this thing out of there, you know, just over your head or something. This was huge to cover this. And yet it was already rolled away. From Peter and John's perspective, that would make no sense. What's happening? Especially the guards aren't there. And then we get the curious contents. The burial cloths that remain. How ridiculously inefficient to strip Jesus' body before taking what you wanted or, or leaving, folding up the, the face cloth itself. It makes absolutely no sense. 
And then you start thinking of the motivation. Even if you concede all these things and say, well, maybe somebody still took the body, they would have to think, why would the religious leaders take the body? Can you imagine the Pharisees saying, you know what? I know Jesus said he was going to rise again, so let's just move the body to freak him out. It'll be a great April Fool's prank. Of course not. I mean, that's absurd, right? And then you imagine Jesus' disciples, which of course is what the Pharisees, we find out after the fact, are going to say to make up a story about. They're going to pay the guards to say that his disciples took the body instead. Why in the world would the disciples take the body? I mean, I imagine to stir up some hysteria, maybe for the original hope, but you know what happened to a lot of those first-generation Christians? They're killed for their faith. Now, many folks have died for a lie, but not many folks knowingly die for a lie. This is a big difference. So even them, they don't have a motivation. We've already mentioned the guards, for goodness sake, they shouldn't take the body unauthorized. They'll be killed too. What happened to the body? Well, it should be obvious to them, but it's slow to process here. It's happening precisely as Jesus said it would. He is not here. He is risen again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus crucified, died, and buried, no longer there. And what really happened, John is about to give voice to here starting in verse 8. Note, then the other disciple, again referring to John, it's being proper referring to himself this way. The one who came to the tomb first, he went in also, and he saw, and he believed. He saw, and he believed. I picture John sitting there, and again, kind of stinky, you know, oh man, but then Peter just dives in like he's Sonic the Hedgehog or something, and John says, okay, let me, let me go in, okay, I watch, I watch the bravado, I'll go in too and come see this. Maybe Peter's like, man, you got to see this, look at this thing. John hops in, and I imagine the first thing he does, he looks around, there's no hidden compartments, there's no strangers lurking over here. There's not some magic portal. There's just the burial cloths and no body. And apparently that itself was enough for John to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Everything clicked. It says he believed. Now we have to ask. We want to be good students of our Bibles. We have to ask, what did he believe? What did he believe? Now in the Gospel of John, you're being cheated slightly because I'm not able to preach all 21 chapters of John today. But if you go through the Gospel of John, you find out very, very early within the Gospel account that the disciples and the apostles had believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They had trusted in Him as the Savior. I do not believe this is what John himself is reporting happened. Once I saw the burial clouds, I finally, finally got convinced that He is the Christ. Nope. He's been a believer for some time. I propose to you what John is saying he finally believed is that, you know what? He's alive. He's alive. The body's not stolen. Nobody came in to raid this tomb like a tomb raider. Jesus is alive. And in fact, you find in verse 9, he even adds an editorial note. Thank you, John. He says, for as yet they, speaking of him and Peter, did not know the scripture that he must rise again. Jesus himself has been telling them this for months. In fact, not long before all this, one of the most remarkable miracles in the book of the Gospel of John took place, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And do you remember Jesus' words that day? I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And I imagine with time, as they're processing everything, working through their grief, and suddenly coming to the realization, my goodness, he's alive. My, wow, I can't even imagine the light bulbs that'd be popping off. I've seen him raise someone else from the dead. You're telling me he himself can be raised from the dead? Who is this? Never seen anything like this before. Now, I remind you, and I caution you, because at first, I don't know about you, I was almost a little bit like, you guys. How did you not get this? Like, come on, this should be obvious, right? But don't be too hard on John. I think it would be a struggle to connect the dots on that weekend in particular. Because again, just two days before, he's the only apostle at the foot of that cross. He's the only one of the apostles who witnessed his beloved Jesus' crucifixion firsthand. The only one who saw Jesus with that twisted crown of thorns making an imprint on his bloody brow. He's the only one of the apostles that saw the bruises and the gashes from the whips and clubs that beat him mercilessly. 
He's the only one of the apostles who watched him march through the crowd, struggling under the weight of the cross. He saw the nails pierce his blood-soaked hands and feet. He saw the anguish gasp at the cross as it was lifted up into the air to put into its final resting place. John heard the mocking of the soldiers. John heard the jeers of the onlookers, the wails of grief from the confused, fearful, and hurting supporters. And he looked Jesus in the eye when Jesus told him and commissioned to him, basically, take care of my mom, Mary. John was there when he heard the final battle cry of Jesus' words, it is finished, as he bowed his head and breathed his last as the Spirit passed on. John was there when he watched the Roman soldiers take that spear and blast it into his side for blood and water to come just pouring forth. He was there when they saw the body lowered and the request granted to give the corpse a proper burial. Oh, John was there, and John saw. Do you find it hard to believe that he had a hard time believing what was taking place in those days? Oh, he saw. And for two more agonizing days from that Friday, he surely sat and paced, cried, and ran out of words, grieved and feared. And then this morning happened. And then the empty tomb happened. And John believed. Jesus is alive. He must have risen, and there is no other explanation. So what do we do with verse 9? For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again. John alludes to the fact that they they didn't fully understand that the scriptures necessitated this. But as we open this morning with that question, which is more important, the answer both, the resurrection is vital and the scriptures paint it so. There's actually a, a story of a famous artist of old, a long time ago, who turned on his fellow artists, his fellow compatriots, And he had a tinge of disgust when he addressed some of these fellow painters. He said, why do you keep filling gallery after gallery with endless pictures on the one theme of Christ in weakness, Christ on the cross, most of all, Christ hanging dead? Why do you concentrate on the passing episode as if it were the last work, as if the curtain dropped on him with disaster and defeat? And this same artist, still a tinge of disgust and just trying to implant within him, he says, That dreadful scene lasted but a few hours, but to the unending eternity, Christ is alive. The stone has been rolled away, and he rules and reigns triumph. I think many of us believers are much like his painting compatriots. Amen for the cross. We should never dispute it. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself even says, I swore to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. Amen and amen. But may we never underemphasize the importance of the resurrection. It is vital, and the scriptures demand it. Why do the scriptures demand it? What is he alluding to in verse 9? Well, we could probably spend a whole week of sermons just on that. But to just survey it, the scriptures demand the resurrection because they attest to his identity and his integrity. The scriptures explain how the resurrection is the absolute linchpin for your salvation and the linchpin for your hope as a Christian. Let's talk about each briefly. You think about the resurrection. The resurrection proved that Jesus is no ordinary man. I mean, who who else can literally have himself rise from the dead? No one. And Jesus, in fact, said that he would do it too, right? That's why I put his integrity up there. Jesus said many things during his earthly ministry. Some pretty audacious things, as a matter of fact. In fact, he caused quite a stir once, if you remember, at one of those miraculous happenings. He said, your sins are forgiven. Well, who has the authority to forgive sins but God, if you remember many of his critics saying? Well, what else did Jesus say? Jesus, on numerous occasions, as again, the apostles and disciples should have remembered, and maybe they did and just doubted, he said several times throughout your Bibles in the New Testament that on the third day I will rise again. I'll be delivered over to the chief priests. I'll be crucified. I'll be executed. He says it in a number of different ways, but he says on the third day I'll rise again. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he's a liar. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there's no reason to put your faith in him. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, his word is about as good for nothing when he says that he offers eternal life to any who believe in him. It would mean nothing. His resurrection proved who he was and that we could trust him. If I could trust a guy who could predict that he would rise from the dead, I think I can trust him when he says, yeah, you trust in me and I'll give you eternal life. I'll give you everlasting life. 
The scriptures paint a picture even as old as the Old Testament. The opening pages of your Bible point out the fact that the resurrection is the basis of your salvation. Somebody had to pay for our consequence of our sin. And the Bible makes it very clear. The consequence of our sin is death. The book of Romans tells us that pretty plainly. The wages of sin are death. But even right there in the opening pages of Genesis, we see death happen right away. As God has to kill something innocent, an innocent animal, in order to clothe the naked Adam and Eve as a covering for their transgression. For sin to be paid for, a death has to occur. Jesus paid the once for all final death for sins. And when God raised him from the dead, it's like God saying, absolutely, I justify precisely what he just did. Payment accepted, you know, like the tabs closed. That's what the empty tomb represents. The debt's gone. He paid for it for any who dare to trust in him for their eternal life their eternal salvation, and the forgiveness of sin. It's based on it, and he proved that his sacrifice was enough by the fact he rose from the dead. And finally, the scriptures point out that the resurrection gives you hope as a believer for the future. Because he lives, he can give us eternal life, even two millennia later, after this blessed event happened. He didn't just die of some old age after he rose again. He still lives today. In fact, he ascended to heaven at the right hand of the Father where he still is right now. He has the authority to forgive your sins. The scriptures say he intercedes on your behalf right now. It's part of his ministry. Jesus couldn't do any of it if he was still in the grave. And in fact, the Bible even talks about the fact that, guess what? If he rose and I've trusted him him for salvation, what's going to happen to me someday? I'm going to rise too. There is a blessed hope to the resurrection. Hope that all of this one day will be made and taken care of. The fact Jesus rose from the dead means he can come back. It means all the promises in the Old Testament about the kingdom coming back to, upon the earth. And the king reigning righteously. The eternal king Jesus upon his throne. If he stayed in that grave, there would be no king eternal to reign forever and ever. But he is risen. He is alive. And he's coming back for you and for me and for all who have placed their trust in him. If Jesus was just an ordinary man, none of those facts would be a reality. We'd be wasting our time here this morning. But the testimony of Scripture is Jesus must rise again. And rise again, he did. So what happens next? Well, from here, we read verse 10, the two disciples return to their homes. If you were to cross us to Luke 24, 12, because John just gives his perspective here, right? This is his gospel account. In Luke 24, we read how Peter apparently marveled at everything that he saw and witnessed. The ramifications of the empty tomb were absolutely staggering to them. Their grief was turned upside down. Their dejection about fearing the worst could now be completely getting rid of. If he was alive, anything's possible. If Jesus is alive, do any of the disciples need to fear death anymore? Do they have to be afraid to show their face in public? Who really won on Friday? It wasn't the Romans, it wasn't the religious leaders, it wasn't Satan and his minions. God won. Christ won. And those who have trusted in him for eternal life, they won too. And the disciples knew it. Does it not blow anybody else away that it says John believed he was alive even though he had not even seen the risen Savior yet? I pondered that a bit. I thought that was just fascinating. And in a gospel account that is specifically, actually, in fact, John himself specifically says This account was written, and I think I have it on a slide here. Aha! John 20, 31, the very end of this chapter. John says, this is why I wrote these these things down. I wanted you to know that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. That you may believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you may have life in His name. That's why John wrote these things down. And how amazing that John himself says, I believe even before I got to see the guy because the evidence was so overwhelming. I believe because I walked and talked with that man for years, you know, three years at that point. And he says, i convinced of who he is. And then, of course, if you keep reading in chapter 20, you can even read about those amazing resurrection appearances. First to Miss Mary Magdalene to overcome her own grief. Later to the disciples and on and on. In fact, I think the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, says Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. Can you imagine that? Just pop up in the middle of nowhere. But John says you can believe. Now, none of us here today have seen the risen Lord face to face, have we? 
You want to know why? Because he's ascended again at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But that is not reason to not believe. Just as John here says, there's ample reason to believe the resurrection. He has risen again. And because he's risen again, the grave does not have the last word. Guilt that you've committed or wrong you've done no longer has to enslave you. Because he's risen, you're no longer destined and condemned to a future of futility. The resurrection means victory for you and I because it was Christ's victory over sin and death and Satan forever and ever. So we celebrate today. We celebrate Resurrection Sunday because of the forgiveness of sins which he accomplished through the cross and the empty tomb. The good news of the risen Christ is that God has done everything necessary to save you from your sins and an eternity apart from him in hell. Jesus paid the death penalty for you. I challenge you this morning, if you were here this morning and you've never placed your trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, I tell you, do not wait because none of us are guaranteed a tomorrow. In fact, I'm praying he comes back today. I would love that the risen Lord Jesus returned to bring us all home right now. But if you've never made that decision to trust in him and what he's done for you, do it now as well because he did it because he loved you. He went to that cross because he loves you. He rose again because he loves you. And of course, if you are a believer here this morning and you already rejoice in these truths, you can draw tremendous encouragement from the fact that, my goodness, because he lives, you will live too. Because he lives, your sins are forgiven. Because he lives, you have an everlasting life. So again, I ask you, how great is our God? How great is our God? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the record which your Holy Spirit has preserved for us here in John chapter 20. The incredible truth and reality of the resurrection, Father, should change our perspective and our outlook forever. Because of the fact that you came, Father, we know that you sent your son, Father, he was born to die, but it's only because he was born to save. And the fact that he accomplished it, Father, and the fact that he lives again, risen from the dead on the third day, Father, the tremendous hope that that brings for each one of us here, Father. I pray, Lord, that today as we go back to our homes to continue celebrating and maybe perhaps partake in traditions that our own families have, Father, that we would keep you at the forefront, the empty tomb and the risen Lord, Father. Now we could always celebrate the fact every Sunday and every day of the week that you are risen and you've done it for us. We ask this all in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing our last couple songs? Yeah.
brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.